Greetings, everyone. Apologies for the slight delay. We had a slight technical difficulty, but welcome to our second webinar in our World NTM Awareness Series. Delighted to have you. I'm Amy Leitman, your host for today's webinar. And I'm very excited to welcome somebody who we all know uh, and love. <laughs> and he's one of our most popular doctors. And a lot of you were very excited to, uh, to join him today. There are uh, about 600 people registered, so I just want to say at the start, we will try to get to everybody's questions, but we may not be able to. So we're very pleased to welcome Chuck Daly. Dr. Charles Daly is Chief of the Division of Mycobacterial and Respiratory Infections at National Jewish Health and a Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health, the University of Colorado, and the ICON School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Daly has served on expert panels for the WHO, CDC, IDSA, and ATS, including as chair of the current guidelines for the management of NTM pulmonary disease. Dr. Daly served as an associate editor for the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine and the Europe European Respiratory Journal. As a scientist, Dr. Daly is actively involved in clinical epidemiologic and translational investigations of mycobacterial infections and bronchiectasis that has resulted in over 200 research publications, chapters, and reviews. As a clinician, he focuses on the care of patients with bronchiectasis and NTM. So just as a reminder for today, you type in your question into the Q&A box and then hit send. Uh, you can send anonymously by checking that little send anonymously box. We'd like to thank our supporters for World NTM Awareness. It's thanks to supporters like them that we can bring really great programming to you. And we are happy to do that year round, but especially for World NTM Awareness, we brought these special webinars to you and we're thrilled to do that. Uh, we hope you'll tune in for the other webinars that are coming up. We have two more coming up. For information and to register, you can log on to worldntmday.org. We'd also like to thank all of our partner organizations for helping us to get the message out. If you log on to worldntmday.org, you can also check out our great organization partners. They do really great work on behalf of patients, and we encourage you to check them all out as well. These are the two upcoming webinars I was talking about, How the Lab Works with Dr. Reedy Kari from National Jewish, and Extra Pulmonary NTM with Dr. Elisa Ignatius. Again, you can register by visiting at worldntmday.org. Chuck, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me share. Okay, Amy, thank you very much for the introduction, also to, uh, for the, uh, the ability to uh, participate today. Um, I'm going to be talking about NTM 101, so I'm really going to focus mostly on the bug. Uh, a lot of the time, I think the lectures are focusing more on the host, uh, but we're going to look at the bug and then how that impacts how we treat our patients. So we'll look at several questions here. First, we'll build a case about, you know, what are these things, NTM? Uh, how many are out there? Which ones are important causes of disease? Which ones are not? Where do they live uh, in the environment? You know, where do we come in contact with them? And very importantly, why are they so hard to kill? And then which, uh, why are they treated differently? So we'll go through each of these. So let's, let's put mycobacteria in its place. Where does it sit in this cascade of life? It starts with the domain. There are three domains of life, uh, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. Um, genomically, these all arose from what's called LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And the first to break off and the oldest are the archaea. These are single-celled organisms. Uh, instead of DNA for replication, they have RNA. And they have three polymerases, which are enzymes that break down the RNA. They have a cell wall, and it's made of pseudopeptidoglycan, but there's no nucleus. The next most closest relative uh, are bacteria. They're also single cell. They also use RNA, but only have one enzyme to break down the RNA. Their cell wall is made of peptidoglycan, so similar but different than the archaea. There's no nucleus. And then here we are. The eukarya, multicellular, these are animals and plants, fungi. We use double helix DNA for replication, and we have a nucleus. But today, we're going to focus on bacteria, because that's what mycobacteria are. They live in the domain of bacteria. 
if you look at them genomically on this this wheel, the closer you are on the wheel, the more genomically similar you are. We can kind of see the relationship across uh, different organisms that live in these domains. I'm going to show you animals here at the top. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but humans, we live genomically somewhere between fungi and slime moles. Uh, fortunately for the mycobacteria, they are away from all of that, and they sit over on this part of the wheel under actinobacteria. So these are scientific names. I think it's important that we just for a moment think about how we do name uh, organisms, because we're going to be looking at a lot of them. So let's start with this process of naming. We start with the domain and move through kingdom, phylum, class, so forth, down to the genus and species. In the clinical world, we live in the genus species. So the names that we use um, are combined of the genus and species. For example, let's look at humans. We are in the domain eukaryota, so that's the multicell organisms, the kingdom animalia, the phylum chordata, and that just means we have a spine. Mammalia is our class, primates the order, the family is hominidae, and genus homo and species sapiens. So the, our name scientifically would be homo sapiens. Let's do the same with Mac. So remember, it's in the domain bacteria, and we can follow the other names as we go down, but we want to get down to the genus and the species. So the genus that we're talking about today, Mycobacterium, and in this example, the species is avium. The name would be Mycobacterium avium, and technically we italicize the genus and species. So that's how, why you see it, it written that way. So then the genus Mycobacterium, the species now, the count is somewhere around over 190. The uh, most famous is Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. That's what causes TB. Probably second most famous is Mycobacterium leprae. That's the cause of leprosy. And then all the others are called non-tuberculous Mycobacteria or NTM. In the figure, what you're seeing are the number of new species between 1970 and 19, or 2015. I mean, it's a dramatic increase. So the numbers continue to go up. And I'll show you in a minute the complexity of how many we have now. Um, and you may say, well, why are these going up? Well, most of the new species are actually, they, we've known about them, but they were uh, called another name. And molecular uh, techniques, uh, whole genome sequencing allows us to split things. And so we'll take one thing, I'll show you examples in, the, in MAC, where we called it one species, but now we know that there are subspecies within that species. And that has driven a lot of these new names. You should also know that um, they're, they're changing names. Uh, this was published in 2018 by a, a genomicist in Canada. He looked at mycobacteria and did a genomic study and said, you know, I think we should actually have mycobacteria, but we should add four new genera. Uh, this was accepted uh, with very little scientific debate. Uh, it mostly affected abscesses because you may see in your laboratory report, if you have abscesses, it may be called Mycobacterioides abscesses now. It used to be Mycobacterium. Turns out it still is. Both names are considered scientifically appropriate, but some labs use Mycobacterioides, some use Mycobacterium. Fortunately, most of the human pathogens are still at the bottom here, Mycobacterium in the tuberculosis semi group. Um, but don't let this confuse you, um, because I know it's confusing clinicians who are not familiar with the term mycobacterioides. I'm an old guy. I still use mycobacterium, and that's what I'll use today. So what makes these organisms different than other bacteria? Well, one of the things is it's, we call it acid fastness. So you'll see often on reports it says acid fast bacillus, or AFB. And that's based on this. So when you give us a specimen, the first thing we do in the laboratory is we stain it. We stain it because we're trying to find those uh, mycobacteria, those bacilli in your sputum specimen. So the way it starts, put it on a slide. We stain it with carbofusion for about 30 seconds. Then we heat it uh, to basically make it stick to the slide. 
Then we pour an acid alcohol on it for about 20 seconds. Then we put another stain, which is a blue stain. We rinse it and we look at it. And if it looks like the example here with rods that are red in color, we call that AFB smear positive. That means we're seeing acid fast bacilli. Other bacteria are not, most of them are not acid fast, so they turn blue with a counter stain. So this is simply referring to their acid fastness, but it's a, one of, of the unique qualities of the, org, of the class of organisms. The other thing is they grow slowly. For example, look at staph. Staph doubles in time in four to 20 minutes. What I mean is if you put a single organism down, it will take four to 20 minutes to have two. So with this kind of speed, you know, within a day, you start to see colony formation. Now compare that to the classic mycobacterium TB, 22 to 48 hours. So that is really slow growth for an organism. And we divide the NTM into slowly growing and rapidly growing NTM. Rapidly growing sounds bad. And if you get a rapid grower, it sounds like it's going to go fast, but it's only rapid when compared to avium. So for example, avium grows in 10 to 16 hours. So more close, more close, more closer to MTB than staff. Fortuitum, which is one of the rapid growers, and obsessus, which we'll talk about in, in some detail, in let's say two to eight hours. So they're faster than avium, they're faster than TB, but they're much, much slower than typical bacteria. The other thing that makes them unique is their cell wall. So you see three different uh, pictures of cell walls and cell membranes. The one on the left are gram negative. That's based on a, a different stain. It's called a gram stain. And in that, when we stain them, the, the bacteria are red. Examples are Pseudomonas, uh, E. coli. Gram positive, they look blue on that stain. This would be Streptococcus, Staphylococcus. And you can see the kind of general thickness of their cell wall. Compare that to mycobacteria. Here's where they're different. They have a very thick cell wall composed of mycolic acids and some other rather unique substances. Some of the time we use them to make a diagnosis. This thick cell wall is very hard for drugs to penetrate. This is one of the main reasons they're so difficult to kill. We can't get the drug inside this very thick cell wall to get inside to affect the machinery that runs the, uh, the organism. They have another property, not very useful anymore clinically, but it's, again, a fairly unique property. In 1959, a botanist named uh, Ernest Runyon, he divided mycobacteria into four groups. The first three groups were slow growers. The fourth were the rapid growers. And again, a rapid grower just means that it grows within seven days on the culture. Whereas a, a slow grower, it takes longer than seven days, often one to three weeks. So the first group we call photochromogens. They're very interesting because when you expose them to light, as in this example, this is Mycobacterium kinsasii, it, it turns color. And you can see this visually. The second group are called scotochromages, and they're always having color. Mycobacterium gordoni, typically a non-pathogen, but in almost all of our water, um, it it's always has a color. And then there's a group that just doesn't really have much color. Avium is an example of that. And then the rapid growers don't change color. Uh, so this changing in color based on light is another fairly unique uh, element. Now, which one of these many MTM species causes disease. So here's the complexity of this field. So this wheel that you see on the left is a genomic wheel like I showed before. It has all known species, uh, and that would be about 199 species and 14 subspecies. It's color coded by their names, by their rate of growth, whether they've been sequenced before, and very importantly, whether they're considered a human pathogen. So on the inner scale, anything in red is a human pathogen. 
So it turns out that most of these organisms are not considered pathogenic to humans. We drink them, we swim in them, we shower in them, and they do not harm us, uh, even if you have a susceptibility. Uh, but some do. And to the right are the most common uh, organisms to cause disease in humans. Among the slowly growing M. avium complex and members within that, M. kinsasii, M. mamoensei, M. simii, and M. zanopi. Uh, for rapid growers, it's Mycobacterium obsessus, Mycobacterium coloni, and fortuitum. So this is kind of a relative pathogenicity scale. So if you take some of those I just mentioned, plus a few others, and you say, well, if someone grows them, what's the chance is going to cause disease? So if you have an isolate and it's to the far right, nearly 100%, that means that 100% of the time it's causing disease. Uh, on the other hand, if it's on the left side of this figure, it's 0%, then it never causes disease, even when it's been isolated from sputum, for example. So let's look at the right. Now, this study comes from the Netherlands, and that's an important uh, issue because the findings in the Netherlands don't always equate in the U.S. or Japan or other countries. So to the far right, Mycobacterium malmoense. 32 or 40 patients in the Netherlands who had this isolated had evidence of disease. So let's say over 75% pathogenicity. Mycobacterium sulgi, a very rare organism, but when you grow it, it's usually causing disease, 11 out of 15 people. Kinsasii also, 12 out of 17. So about 75% of the time, if someone grew these, it was causing disease. Now, if we jump to the middle, around 50%, we see abscessus, subspecies abscessus, sinope, and avium. And the avium, that's about what we've seen in other studies, that about half the time someone grows it is causing harm, the other half it's not. And then let's go to the far left. We see an organism most people will never see, um, but you'll see Mycobacterium gordoni. It grows in sputum frequently because it's in our water, but it doesn't generally harm us. Now, when it's not in the in, in our lung, but maybe in a joint, yeah, of course it can harm us. But that's again very rare. Now, here's the thing I want to point out. Look where intracellularity is. It's down in that low pathogenicity scale in the Netherlands. But that's not where it sits in the US. Uh, it's much more pathogenic. It's more similar to avium. Uh, and if we go back to the right, malmoense, we almost never see this in the U.S. And when we do, it doesn't seem to be causing disease. So this is more complex than I think most people realize, that even the same species in a different geographic region may have different pathogenicity. Presumably, it's picked up different mutations over time uh, that may make it more virulent or less virulent. But in general, I think we can line up organisms across a scale like this, um, uh, at least based on local information. Now, it turns out just within MAC, there are variations in which ones tend to cause disease. Little known fact, there are 10 species that sit within the complex of MAC and seven subspecies. So here are the two most common, M. avium, M. intracellulari. There are four species of avium, avium, hominosuis, paratuberculosis, and sylvaticum. Avium is primarily in birds, um, but in humans, we get homina swiss. Um, this is also what pigs get. So people are afraid of having a bird, but the bird, even if it has avium, that's typically not what humans get. They can't. So it's not, I can't see you never will. It, it, we do find subspecies avium in humans, but mostly we find homina swiss. Paratuberculosis is mainly in cows. It causes a, a unique disease called Yanni's disease. And sylvaticum, also very rare cause of human disease. So even within avium, there's variation in the pathogenicity to humans. Intracellulary has three subspecies. The, the most common is intracellulary. As I mentioned, it's clearly pathogenic to humans. Chimera would be the second. It used to be a species. It's now a subspecies. Uh, it was uh, one of the causes of disseminated disease in people who had bypass surgery. And then Yonganense used to be a species. It is now a subspecies, and it's the third most common cause of disease in humans from uh, intracellularity. Now, what about the others? 
So you probably haven't heard of the others. These are all considered MAC. Now, the reason you haven't heard of them and the reason clinicians haven't heard of them is the laboratory is not reporting them, um, which we think is in, incorrect uh, because there's variation in pathogenicity. So if you grew columbiense three times, it's un, very uncommon cause of human disease. I would give pause on whether I should treat you or not. But most laboratories don't tell me that you grew columbiense. They told me you grew avium intracellulary complex, and they stopped there. But you can see now we're learning that there are multiple species. There is variation in pathogenicity. Um, and occasionally we will see uh, disease caused in humans by these more rare uh, subspecies. So let's think about disease that are being caused by these ones that we've just reviewed. It turns out probably the first time uh, MAC caused disease was in chickens. It was called avian tuberculosis. This was uh, described in England in 1868. But the first human cases were much later. It was not until the 1930s. This is an example of a case that was published in 1943 who had MAC, extensive MAC, and he had silicosis. Silicosis is a, a disease that we see in people who work with uh, sandblasting, as an example. And the top part of the lung, it's all white. So it's all inflamed, fibrotic, affected. Uh, the lower lung zones are not normal, but more normal because they're blacker. So this was severe disease. But again, this human conditions were being described in the 30s and 40s, although the organism itself was clearly uh, known before then. And now we know how it harms us. Uh, in the past years, we've seen numerous uh, in, uh, increase in cases, and we described two general phenotypes, uh, nodular brachiectatic disease and fibrocavitary. On the left, in the center, we see the heart, and on either side of that, we see these clusters of what look like grapes. These are dilated airways, so that's bronchiectasis uh, in the right middle lobe and lingula. And then on the right, we see the other phenotype, fibrocavitary. Here in the right upper part of the lung, there's a large cavity. This uh, form of disease usually occurs in males, previous smokers, uh, whereas nodular uh, bronchiectatic is usually women, usually non-smokers. Uh, there's a lot we don't understand about why people get these forms of, uh, or these different forms. Recognize there is overlap between uh, the two syndromes, so it's not perfectly two phenotypes that we work with. I also just want to remind you that these things can harm us other ways, and you're going to have a, a lecture on extrapulmonary. Um, these are all in people who had infection. This was someone who had uh, a tooth removed and abscesses came out through the cheek. This is someone who had LASIK surgery and got uh, abscesses infection. This is someone who had hand, uh, well, actually injury to the hand that got infected with MAC, uh, similar here. This is a bone that's being destroyed by mycobacterium abscesses. This is someone who had rheumatoid arthritis. This is someone who had um, collagen injected into their face and got abscesses. And this was someone who had uh, went to the salon to have a, a pedicure and develop these large ulcers on their legs uh, due to abscesses. So the point is these things are in the environment and if it, there are a lot of ways they can get into our body, mostly through trauma and surgery, uh, but you'll hear a lot more about that. But, but these organisms do harm us. One of the questions that comes up, do they, do they only harm humans? What about animals? Because animals are out in the same environment. It turns out they very much harm animals. Uh, there's a condition I mentioned earlier, one of the subspecies of avium that produces the Yawnese disease in most cows. Avium, little known fact, can cause disseminated disease and death in miniature schnauzers because some of them have a genetic defect that makes them highly susceptible to avium. Kansasii has been sh shown to cause disease in multiple different animals, as has Zenopi. Uh, Lepermurium uh, actually causes leprosy in cats and rats. Um, Mycobacterium leprae, the cause of leprosy, 
um, you know, infects armadillos. Um, that's where we see it in the United States, but also red squirrels and some other primates. Marinum lives in the, uh, like salt water, so it lives in the ocean, can infect fish. And when we get poked by a fish or a shrimp or a hook, we can get it also. Mycobacterium fortuitum has infected whales, obsessus whales and walruses, and tuberculosis has been seen in elephants and ruminants. And I hate to tell you, but the humans are giving it to the elephants. So these things are uh, seen in other uh, uh, animals, not just humans. So where do they live? If animals are getting them and we're getting them, they must be very widespread in the environment. So let's think of conceptually how this would happen. So this is uh, a concept that Becky uh, Prevo at the NIH uh, published. So if we look here to the left, we're exposed to an environment, uh, which she divided into a specific external environment and a general internal environment. So in that specific, we get exposed to showers because of biofilms that develop, plumbing in general, maybe gardening, in the more general external environment, this is an environment that's kind of out of our control where there are climate changes. And we know there's variation in species and the amount of mycobacteria based on climate, uh, even the mineral content in the soil in which we, we, uh, we live and how water is managed. But we are exposed to these in varying degrees. And this is our internal environment, meaning do we have a disease that makes us susceptible it could be sex-based. It could be related to age, low BMI. But I've always said it takes two to tango. You've got to have a susceptibility in general and have an exposure to develop NTM. Um, all of this leads to us, even if we get NTM infections, some will get cavitary disease, some will not, and some will not get disease. This is a fairly complex interplay that must be happening in, in, in our lives all the time. That, and so our exposures are probably common. And these are just some of the exposures that have been uh, documented. Uh, uh, so for example, any kind of aerial, aerosolized water from our showers, water taps, hot tubs, spas, pools, all of these we've been able to isolate. We and others have been able to isolate mycobacteria in those sources. And in some cases match genetically what we found in that shower head or that hot tub with what's in the human body. Uh, aerosols from humidifiers, this has been documented, uh, both ho whole home humidifiers as well as portable uh, humidifiers. Heating and ventilation, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, particularly if they have uh, the humidifiers as I mentioned. Uh, here at National Jewish years ago, um, NTM was isolated from uh, the uh, potting soils. It's also been isolated from dirt in various places a nice study from Australia. And then we, we posit that aspiration because we know that MTM have been isolated from gastric contents. So we presume, although difficult to prove, that um, people who are aspirating could be soiling their lung through that mechanism. But these are just a few of the places that we know the people have been infected. So they get into us, they cause harm. So why are they so hard to kill? I can give you five days of azithromycin and cure your pneumonia uh, if you have a streptococcal pneumonia. Why is it so hard to kill these other forms of bacteria? Well, let's hearken back just as a reminder to this cell wall. It is very hard to get current antibiotics to penetrate this armor. Um, and we believe that one of the ways synergy may work is that one antibiotic may disrupt the cell wall so that the other uh, antibiotic gets in there. And there are things that are currently in development that, that do just that. They're not even antibiotics, but they're able to disrupt the cell wall. And we, and we hope that that means that the antibiotics will penetrate and now they will work better. But the main reason these are so hard is they're just very resistant to antibiotics. And there's different kinds of resistance and they have them all. That we talk about intrinsic versus acquired. Intrinsic means that if you go out in nature and you test some from nature, they're resistant. Uh, they were never exposed to that, but they're just inherently or intrinsically resistant. 
where is acquired means that they were initially susceptible, but after exposure to the antibiotic, they have now become resistant. So mycobacteria, for example, are intrinsically resistant to the penicillins. You could pour penicillin on them and it will not do anything because they're resistant. The mechanism, it doesn't work. Acquired resistance, these are chromosomal mutations that occur uh, over the course of treatment, for example. There's now some evidence of horizontal transfer, which means one organism transfers a gene to another organism. Now, we don't like this, right? Because that's one way that resistance can move more quickly. And then there's inducible versus constitutive. So constitutive is more intrinsic. They have a mutation, it makes them resistant. Inducible is they have a mutation that when you first test the isolate in the laboratory, and I'll show an example of this, it looks susceptible. But after being exposed to that for some period of time, it now becomes resistant. And this is very important with the macrolides. And now we have these molecular techniques. We can actually sometimes see that in your sputum specimen, for example, you have different population. Some are susceptible to azithromycin and some are resistant. Uh, if we just do it the old fashioned way, uh, not using molecular methods, we can't see that. And we might mislabel people as resistant, com completely resistant or completely susceptible when in fact it's a mixture. Now this is a blow your mind uh, um, thing, but it, it, it's a visual. So this is something we published from our lab. We tested thousands of organisms across the US using standard methodologies. And these are slowly growing mycobacteria on the left of the species, the top uh, or MAC. And, and basically what this is showing is just look at the color. Uh, if the color is red, it's highly resistant. If it's blue, it's susceptible and everything in between. And so if we look at the MAC species, you'll see that we don't have a lot of susceptibility uh, to work with, mainly with amikacin and clarithromycin. And if it's clarithromycin susceptible, it's, it's azithromycin susceptible. And as we go down in some of the more unusual ones, we just see really a lot of variability, but mo more resistant than susceptible. So this means that most of the antibiotics that we test are not going to be uh, very active uh, uh, in the treatment regimen. So this is the slowly growing. These are rapidly growing and the top is Mycobacterium obsessus. It's even worse. Look how much red there is. And the, these are the drugs that we test in our standard panels. The good news, if you get some of the more unusual ones, they tend to be more susceptible across the board. But obsessus is a highly resistant organism. And because of that, we don't have many, uh, we don't have many antibiotics to use to build an effective regimen. This is an example of inducible macrolide resistance. And this is so critical when we treat obsessus. So this is something we published several years ago. Um, on the left, you see we had 19 um, isolates of mycobacterium obsessus subspecies obsessus. And we did regular susceptibility testing. The MIC is the minimal inhibitory concentration. It's a standard thing, which I'll show you in a minute so you understand how we determine if something's resistant. But suffice it to say here, the lower the number, the more susceptible. So you can see we, we, we looked at the cut points that are published that, that, that determine whether susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. Then at day three, which is the standard time we read drug susceptibility, we said, is this, are they susceptible? And they were all susceptible. And then we looked again at day seven, and then we looked again at day 14, and we saw this increasing resistance that was occurring. And by day 14, they were highly resistant. Now, the reason this happened is we were incubating these isolates uh, over this period of time with clarithromycin. And the clarithromycin was basically activating a gene called an ERM gene, which made it become resistant. Now, we did this with a, another obsessus, but this is subspecies Mycelians, and its ERM gene doesn't work. And as you can see here, despite incubating it over 14 days, it never became resistant. And this is a critical principle when treating mycobacterium obsessus, is macrolide susceptible disease, the 
erythromycin and the azithromycin work, but they it, they do not work with the other subspecies. So the laboratory is critical here uh, for us to be able to figure out how to treat. And it's why we treat people even with abscesses differently. So let's segue. How do we treat people? I think you're all familiar with the two, uh, uh, the 2020 guidelines. These were revived, uh, revised after 13 years. Um, this, this is the first time that four societies supported the guidelines. The American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society were two of the pulmonary societies. The Infectious Disease Society of America and the European Society for Clinical Micro and ID. So we had two uh, ID societies, and we had two from North America and two from Europe. This was our attempt to kind of get more uh, exposure, broader, hope, hopefully broader um, uh, implementation of these guidelines. And one of the first things that they tell us is that we need to do drug susceptibility testing. So this is kind of the what we think about. When we first think about this person may have uh, NTM, we order a specimen. Uh, we do that stain, looking to see if it's AFB smear positive or not. People who are positive have a higher bacterial load, and that is a risk factor for progression. So we're probably more likely to treat that person. But now we're waiting for the culture to grow. And ultimately, we're also waiting for the lab to tell us which species it is. Is it pathogenic or not? And then in order to treat, we're also waiting for drug susceptibility testing. And this is a long time. You all know as patients who have these infections, you wait and you wait and you wait for results, uh, and so do we. But we're waiting because we need those susceptibility results to guide us to get you on appropriate treatment. This is a busy slide, but it, it tells the entire story, the strengths and weaknesses of drug susceptibility testing. So this is called a micro titer plate. In real life, it's a plastic, got little indentions in it, and, and it, it comes with an antibiotic in it of different concentrations. So at the bottom here, we're starting with a very low concentration of, let's say, whatever antibiotic you want to, to look at, and it, it increases as we go from left to right. So let's go to the top. In row 12, this is a sterile control. Nothing should grow there. In row 11, this is a positive control. It should grow because there's no antibiotic in that one. So let's look at this isolate, isolate A. So there's no growth here. That's good. There is growth here. That's what we want to see. Now, what we're going to see at a low concentration, we see growth. And as we go to higher concentrations, eventually there's no growth. So that's what we call the minimal inhibitory concentration or MIC. And that's the numbers you see on the reports uh, from us and other laboratories. So when it stops growing, that's what we call the MIC and it would be 64. So that's pretty high for most things, more in the resistant range. Now let's just look at another example. Shouldn't grow here, should grow here because there's no antibiotic. And then, wow, this thing is growing all the way, all the way to the top, 128. So all we can say here, and you'll see it reported this way, is the MIC is greater than 128 because we don't know what it is. It, we don't have another column. Now, here we have one that doesn't grow. So this is highly susceptible. So its, it's MIC would be 0 0.25. All of these others are just showing things that can go wrong. And that means we have to repeat. And that means a delay in you getting your report. For example, this one looks like the MIC is one, but then several, then it's I got this positive out here. So that, that could be a contamination. This one uh, looks like it converted to, and then it pops up again. That shouldn't happen. So that's gonna get repeated. Pretty much all of these will get repeated if they don't show what we expect. Um, and that means you're going to wait several more weeks. So the MIC is what drives our decisions uh, with several of the drugs. For MAC, it's two drugs. Uh, the guidelines recommend that we test clarithromycin and amicacin against your MAC isolate. And then we have very specific cut points for determining if it's susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. 
And you can see the numbers there. So again, the higher the value, the less active it is and eventually resistant. Now, the reason we, we recommend testing these two drugs is we have clinical data that shows if that isolate is resistant to either one of these drugs and you take it, your response will be poor. And so we're not going to give you that. We're not going to give you a drug that's just going to make you feel bad, but not going to help you. Note that if you see that the rifampin and the ethambutol, if you even see them on the report, and it says they're resistant or they're susceptible, we don't even look at that because we don't have any correlation between those MICs and how a patient does. Hopefully someday we will have data that is better, but the data that we have today shows no correlation. So we focus on clarithromycin, and if it's susceptible to clarithro, it's susceptible to azithro. So that leads us to how we treat MAC. We have these two phenotypes that I showed you, nodular bronchiectatic disease. Um, if it's that, we can use three drugs, azithromycin preferred, rifampin, ethambutol. We can give it three times a week until the cultures are negative for 12 months. Cavitary disease, we want to use more drugs. And refractory disease, we want to use more drugs. So azithromycin, rifampin, ethambutol. In cavitary disease, we use IV amicacin. In refractory disease, we usually use uh, amicacin liposome inhalation suspension. If in cavitary and refractory disease, we give daily therapy, although we still give the, uh, the aminoglycoside three times a week. This is what we expect in a patient who has a macrolyse susceptible, non-cavitary disease, culture conversion, you know, 80% or so. But with cavitary disease, generally lower than that. Recurrence is high in both groups, 25 to 48%. And if you do some genetic testing, you'll show that Half the time, the 75% of the time, it's actually a different organism. Reinfection has occurred, presumably from another exposure. We're not talking about macrolide resistance, but it's very important we don't develop it as clinicians. We have to be very careful about treating people appropriately because once macrolide resistance occurs, we don't do surgery. And if we don't give you an aminoglycoside like amicacin, culture conversion has been as low as 5 to 15%. If we do do surgery and give you a half a year or more of uh, IV amicacin, yes, we can get your culture conversion up, but then you as a patient has to go through the surgery and the prolonged IV therapy. So I'm going to end with abscesses. The abscesses is so complex. I don't really want to get into a lot of detail, but make the point of why we treat people differently. So abscesses was discovered in 1953 in this person's knee and some subcutaneous buttocks or abscesses on their buttocks. It, was, it wasn't named till 92. Then it got shown that it probably should be three species, not one in 2006. Uh, one of the names was removed because it was a naming era. In 2013, with colleagues um, in Korea, we redid genomic studies and proposed that these are subspecies and there should be three. This was confirmed in 2016. This is now the current uh, norm. There are three subspecies, abscesses, Massiliense, and Belletii. And I mentioned the new name, Mycobacterioides. Importantly, is when we look at that inducible gene, most strains of abscesses have a functional gene, which means azithromycin doesn't work. Um, Massiliense never has a functional gene, so it does work. And Belletii is like abscesses. So knowing the species, I can better predict whether or not it's going to respond to an azithromycin. And that's why when we, this is a report, a typical report coming from our, our laboratory, looking at all of these drugs, because this is what I need to figure out which regimen to put you on. But just like with MAC, the main two things we're looking at, or is it susceptible to amicacin, is it susceptible to clarithromycin? And this isolate, you can see it was susceptible to amicacin, so I can use that. I can use it IV, I can use it inhaled. Unfortunately, it was resistant to the macrolides. So that's going to make it more difficult to build a regimen. This is right out of the guidelines, too complex to spend time on. But I just want you to look to the left. Our decision process is based on whether it's macrolides susceptible or resistant. And if it's susceptible, we're going to want to treat with three or more drugs. But if it's resistant, we need additional help. So then we try to build a regimen of four or more. 
And we go down the middle there, picking those drugs, some IV, some oral. And at the end of the day, it really matters if it's susceptible or not, because we can get to 80% culture conversion if it's susceptible to azithromycin, but it's generally less than 40% um, with resistant disease. And obviously, this is a place where we need new drugs. They are coming, uh, but they're not here yet. So we're still using this approach when we build regimens to treat abscesses. So I'm going to leave with that. Um, this is our new outpatient center. We have uh, doubled our clinical space here. We're very excited about that. And uh, I hope uh, if you need care from us, please uh, come visit and uh, we'll do the best we can for you. Thank you. We do have questions. Um, so somebody's asking a question about sinusitis and rhinitis. Um, they're asking, do you think that is a contributing factor to bronchiectasis? Um, well, they're probably a contributing factor to exacerbations. Uh, not so clear that they cause bronchiectasis, but if you have pseudomonas, for example, in your sinuses, it's hard for that pseudomonas would be a gravity not to get into your lower airways and cause your um, cause lower respiratory infection and exacerbations. Okay. Um, does having multiple NTM infections over several years, for example, having MAC a couple of times or having abscesses um, and having underlying bronchiectasis, does that increase your risk of mortality? And do we know, do we have a sense of like how, you know, what the increase? factor is um i think what it, it it what it does is it unfortunately uh, increases your risk of progression of your bronchiectasis and then as it progresses you're more susceptible to additional infection so it's really a vicious cycle it's why we try so hard to prevent infection and, and the best way we can do that now is the airway clearance um okay. in terms of mortality the mortality is very there's several factors that that affect mortality. But one, probably the most important is age. Uh, as we get older, yes, our mortality goes up. Um, but as you have more severe uh, physiologic impairment, uh, that's also going to increase the risk of uh, mortality. Um, somebody's asking about a, 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 a new enzymatic cocktail that's being researched at Colorado State um, that could possibly kill NTM in conjunction with traditional antibiotics. Do you know anything about that? Uh, well, they're, 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 they're working with a company that makes uh, this uh, enzyme cocktail. And that's the one I was referring to that can disrupt the uh, cell wall. I mean, if you look at it under the microscope and you put this uh, cocktail on it, the cell wall just starts tearing apart. Um, whether it will be enough by itself, probably not. It'll, it'll probably just be synergistic with uh, other antibiotics, but it, but it might mean that we can use maybe uh, antibiotics that aren't as potent and have less side effects. It might just benefit us in several ways. The key is it's under study. It needs to be studied, but I think the principle is exciting. Um, somebody's asking about co-infections with MAC and m abscessus at the same time. Do you treat one before the other or do you treat both at the same time? How would you normally handle something like that? Yeah, this is not an uncommon. And uh, you know, we published a paper years ago about our treatment of uh, M. obsessus patients and their outcomes. And it turned out that 55% of our obsessus patients either currently had or previously had MAC. So this idea of having both is very common. Usually it's MAC first, then obsessus. Um, when people come in at, with them at the same time, the first thing we do is try to get an assessment of, is one dominant. So we like to get multiple cultures over weeks. And if you grow abscessus in two, but you grow MAC in all of them, our step is we go after MAC first. We can survey for the abscessus. You're going to be getting monthly cultures when you're on treatment for an NTM. So we'll see, does the M, M abscessus go away? Does it stay stable or does it start becoming dominant? Um, if they both are pretty much similar bacillary load, meaning they grow the same amount of time, we will, in fact, treat both at the same time. And we will alter the regimens a bit so that we'll put in drugs that get both. An example, rifampin does not kill abscesses, but clofazamine kills MAC and abscesses. So we will substitute clofazamine for rifampin 
Um, and, and, and that's how we think. We're trying to get, usually it's about five drugs. Uh, and so it sounds like a daunting regimen. It is a daunting regimen. Uh, I just had someone last week that uh, I saw who we got rid of the MAC. Uh, so we stopped their MAC regimen, uh, but we're still treating the obsessives. We're not quite there yet. So that, that's how we think about it. Okay. Um, here's an interesting question about lung inflammation. Um, it's from somebody they're asking um, if, if you, if your lung is showing inflammation, but not showing damage yet, would um, would nebulizing with a hypertonic saline increase the risk of developing inflammation? Um, no, I, I don't know of any data that shows that hypertonic saline increases inflammation. There are some data that it decreases inflammation. So no, I, I, I would consider doing that. Uh, in the setting of bronchiectasis, uh, I, I, I wouldn't do it if there, there was not bronchiectasis. Uh, not because I think it'll harm you, it's because I don't have any evidence that it'll benefit you. Um, so uh, inflammation is our enemy. <laughs> uh, we want to prevent it, and that's what the drugs that are coming down the market now that are being, uh, you know, trialed, uh, they're all trying to do that. They're all trying to decrease inflammation um, because that has got to be a good thing. Okay. Um, somebody is asking, they, they, they were just wondering, what exactly does the myco in mycobacteria mean? Is there like something specific? Uh, no, good question. Um, no, it's, uh, uh, it, you know, myco uh, actually refers to fungus. And early on, I think maybe they were thinking they were a fungus and uh, the myco was used. Uh, obviously they're not fungi, but this, the name st stayed. You know, in taxonomy, this gets back to that mycobacteria, uh, uh, mycobacterioides. Once you name something and it is accepted, it stays forever. So uh, even if you make, a, a, if it's wrong, the only way to change that is to formally petition to change it. Uh, and that seldom happens. Uh, so names, maybe not perfect names, but they stay that way. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about the efficacy of clofazamine and ethambutol for MAI. Um, there is there do we have actual data on that yet or are we still waiting for a study result yeah so um clofazamine so the you clean know, again clofazamine's been around for over half a century it's probably the only drug i know of that every organism we've tested susceptible to it oh, every mycobacterial organism is susceptible to it has low mic's for all the organisms we've tested um so we use a lot of it, um, but we do so based really mostly on the in vitro data that is very active, not clinical trials. However, there are data. So in Calgary, uh, Julie Jaron, who spent a couple of years with us, um, is running the NTM program up there. She uses clofazamine, and that program traditionally used it. And though they published, a, wasn't a trial, but they looked at their patients who got rifampin, and they looked at culture conversion, and they look at those people that got treated with clofazamine. And the culture conversion was about 100% in those who had MAC and got clofazamine. I think it was around 70% in those who got rifampin. So that was some clinical data. There's been a recent study, randomized study in the Netherlands by Jaco van Ingen, where people got either azithromycin, ethambutol, and clofazamine, or azithromycin, ethambutol, and rifampin. So it is a randomized comparative study. It's a small study. But they showed the same. Culture conversions were the same. So we, the best we can say from the data, it appears to be as good or maybe better than rifampin. Um, uh, how much it does by itself, we don't yet know that. But that study is being done now. Uh, it's a monotherapy study to look at the activity of clofazamine and MAC. It should finish this year. Uh, Kevin Winthrop at Oregon is leading that study. I, I'm going to predict it's going to fail. Because in animal models and others, clofazamine by itself doesn't look great. It looks good because it, when you pair it with other drugs, we see synergy. So we, we think it's one of these drugs where it needs to be with another drug uh, to bring kind of bring out the best in both drugs. Um, but we'll, we'll see that the results of that hopefully we'll know uh, within a year.
Okay, somebody's asking about um, an infection with um, Mycobacterium mucogenicum. Mm -hmm. um, they have also, they have bronchiectomy. Yeah. So I guess what they're asking is how, um, you know, how pathogenic is M. mucogenicum? Is okay. it one of the more virulent ones? No, mucogenicum, it's a wrapper grower. It's in water. Uh, we isolate it. it. It's been associated with pseudo outbreaks, meaning isolate it. You know, the people are growing it in their sputum, but it's not harming them. It turns out it was in the hospital water. Uh, so mucogenicum, we almost never treat. Uh, we do good airway clearance first. Um, we've seen people grow it and, it, and then they quit growing it, and never grew it again. We've seen people grow it, but it never progressed. Rarely, yes, it can cause uh, disease, but it's one of the least pathogenic uh, of the mycobacteria. Okay. Um, the, we have somebody who um, is writing in, they had a subcutaneous skin infection and they were put on Keflex. Um, th they're on it right now. And uh, they're still on their NTM protocol, but they've noticed that as they started the Keflex, their cough has decreased considerably and they're having a lot less sputum. They're wondering if you know why that might be, if this is a temporary effect. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Keflex is a broad spectrum antibiotic. So it gets a lot of different or organisms. It gets gram positive that I was talking about earlier, you know, staphs and streps. It gets gram negatives. Doesn't get pseudomonas, but it gets some other gram negatives. So uh, what it tells me is you have another bacteria in your lung, and that's what it's treating. It has no activity against mycobacteria. So this this is actually very common. People have mixed infections. Some of them are anaerobic infections. These don't grow in our sputum cultures. Uh, there are other bacteria that don't grow very well. Uh, so we don't isolate them. Uh, but it sounds like that's what's happening. Now, how long that will last, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's one of those, uh, when we treat someone for a bacterial infection and you know, we treat and then we stop and we wait to see, did it work? Did it last? So hopefully it lasts. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about genetic components. They say their mother, they and their mother both have bronchiectasis. They've both had Mac and other NTMs that they live in different house households, households. Um, should they be thinking about a genetic component? Um, yeah, I, I do think that the, in this setting, you know, we have a number of patients who have multiple people in the family who've had bronchiectasis. Always in that setting, we always check for CF. We always check for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, depending on the, uh, it, the characteristics, we might check for ciliary dyskinesia. But a lot of the genetics, that, and beyond that, we don't understand the genetics of bronchiectasis. We believe it's probably a multi-genomic disease. In other words, it's not like CF where you just have a mutation, it's clear, and it causes disease. Uh, it's probably more complex. You probably get several mutations in different parts of the genes. Uh, so the main thing are to, to find out if any of those three known genetic diseases are present. Uh, I have a, patients of a grandma, ma, and daughter. All three have bronchiectasis. All three have MAC. Um, they live in different households, same state. Um, so uh, it, it does happen, uh, it, but it, it's fairly unusual. We put out a call years ago for people uh, who uh, had siblings, or uh, not siblings, but uh, first degree relatives uh, to contact us because we wanted to do genetic testing. Um, and unfortunately, we got very few uh, responses. Um, so I, I don't think it's that common. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions about sputum samples um, that um, for the initial sampling, there's, you're collecting two to three sputum samples to confirm the diagnosis and there's a, they're collected one week apart. Can you uh, um, answer why, why that's the case, why that's done? Well, we know uh, that one sputum specimen does not have enough sensitivity to detect all the or to be positive, for example. If you have MAC down there, we want to know. One will not necessarily tell us that. If you add two to that, it jumps considerably. If you add three to that, it jumps just a little bit. So we we find 80 plus percent of the cases with just two sputum. The third just takes it up a little bit more. The reason we want to do uh, to separate the specimens is because these can be contaminants, right? You might have just gone on vacation and jumped in the hot tub and hailed some Mac, and now 
we do it in three days, they're all positive. We say you meet disease criteria, but if we wait a week or two, you may have cleared these. So it's just giving your body time to clear contaminants. Um, the, uh, and, and that's really the, the, bo the, the, the bottom line. Now with TB, we don't need to do that because TB is, in, is not a contaminant, right? It's not coming from the environment. So for TB, we get three sputum specimens, three days in a row. Now at National Jewish, if you come visit us and stay with us on our unit, we get three in a row for the first time because it's just a practicality issue. We need to get them before we start doing anything. But su subsequently, we'll be doing them spread apart. Okay. Um, okay. In our dry climate, we have a humidifier in our HVAC system to protect the hardwood floors. Uh, they're asking, well, they're asking, can we test this for NTM? I, I guess that depends on the access to the system. Really, I, I guess it's a question of should they test it and, you know, what? Well, yeah, what well, Joe, Fal Joe Falkenham, who has spoken uh, for you many times, he would be just saying, drain the humidifier. I mean, that's that's the end of discussion for him. Yeah. Uh, you, you can access it. We do know of people, patients of ours, one in particular, um, the, the wife had uh, Mac twice, then the husband got it. Very rare. So we said something's up here. Uh, they sent their uh, humidifier water to Joe Falkenham and then was positive and it was the same genetic matches that was in them. So that water was infected and it was 24 seven spewing it out throughout the house. So uh, we're not fans of humidifiers um, here in Colorado. I don't have one, it's very dry here. Uh, right. So um, I, I, I would say, I wouldn't use a humidifier if someone in the home has a susceptibility to NTM, maybe bronchiectasis, any kind of lung disease, any kind of immune deficiency. Then I don't. I would would not use a humidifier. Um, here's a, a question that's kind of the opposite: Is there a danger in heat pumps that have AC heat and dehumidifying capabilities? Uh, the dehumidifier, no. No, not really, unless when you're getting rid of it, you know, you're not careful and create a um, aerosol. Okay. Um, so we have somebody who's got a, they have CLL, which I think is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Yeah. And they've had MAC for uh, eight years. Um, they've been on treatment uh, without uh, clearing it. Um, is this something you've seen before? How do these things interact? Well, definitely, I've seen. Um, you know, that's uh, that's not a normal immune system in someone like that, even if they're not on chemotherapy. Um, and I just saw someone last week with this, and they have MAC, and so it's a concern. And then, particularly in this patient I'm talking about, they're progressing, and I'm, I'm going to have to treat them. Uh, so any kind of hematologic. Uh, abnormality that results in some degree of immune deficiency is a risk factor. And I think it's the kind of thing that when we're in that, should we be watchful waiting or should we be treated, tends to push us for treatment. Okay. Um, we have uh, somebody asking about um, a co-infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and abscessus mycelianzi. Mm -hmm. um, should they wait? They they tested positive for both, and they're asking: Should they wait to be treated, or should they wait to get results of future sputum sputum samples? Yeah, you know, co uh, co pathogens are very common. And somewhere between a quarter and a third of our patients with NTM are co infected with Pseudomonas. So this is common. If someone is having an exacerbation, or or, or they're just kind of slowly developing more symptoms, like a productive cough. We always treat the copathogen first. So in that case, we always go after pseudomonas because you'll know within days if the pseudomonas is what's causing it. Whereas if you started treatment for MAC, you won't know for weeks, maybe months, if, if the symptoms are getting better. So we go after pseudomonas first, usually 14 days of an oral if it's available. If not, an intravenous course of anti-pseudomonal therapy. Look how much benefit did we get uh, and then kind of reassess where are we with MAC? You know, if, are we going to be in a watchful waiting? 
mode are we going to initiate treatment? But always co-pathogen first. Um, we have a couple of questions about, um, you know, wait and see versus treat. So if somebody's asking about MAC or MII and somebody's asking about abscesses, but um, one person saying if you have low symptoms, is it better to wait to see if something comes out in the future for abscesses? And then uh, somebody else is saying, echoing the above question, if you're younger, is it better to treat MAC aggressively or wait and see if you can clear through airway clearance and wait and see? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'll tell you, this is the hard part in this field, which is we have to individualize things so much. Yeah. Um, and, and really, I think symptoms uh, are the big driver of whether we initiate treatment. I mean, if someone's very symptomatic, I want to, I want to, uh, you know, re relieve them as much as I can. So I'm going to recommend treatment. If we see progression on a scan, even if there are not many symptoms, I know symptoms are coming. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And why wait for them? Because they don't always get better with treatment. So I would recommend treatment at that time. I definitely think in younger patients, we're more aggressive because uh, we know recurrences can occur. Um, and we every infection that individual gets may result in more symptoms or more progression. So we're aggressive not only at treating, but to their point, using good airway clearance. Right now, it's the only way we know to prevent infection is doing good airway clearance. We think some of the drugs coming down the uh, 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 pathway uh, will probably do the same and help us prevent infection. Uh, but for now, it's airway clearance, treat when people are symptomatic or when we see signs of progression. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we have a couple of very interesting questions about TB. So what would what treatment would you discuss rec recommending for patients having both NTM and TB? Uh, another thing that's become increasingly common, um, well, we always 100% of the time treat TB first. Um, uh, to the TB therapy now for drug susceptible TB is as short as four to six months. Probably will be as short as two months in the next few years. Even for the most resistant forms, XDRTB, the treatment is six months. So we, it's not that long. So we would say treat the TB. It's a public health issue. It can kill people. You can spread it to other people. So let's get rid of the TB. Then let's focus on the NTM. There are times where, uh, are, and these are very rare, where we're very convinced that it's the NTM that's causing the problem because the TB cultures are now negative, but now they're smear positive with abscesses and we see cavities forming. Yes, in that setting, we're going to go after the abscesses. But because of the public health significance, we, let, let's make the TB therapy is, you know, um, uh, the priority. Then we move on. Um, we have another question about TB. Um, I'm currently working at a national TB reference lab, but we do not test for NTM. What What do you advise? Th that's typical. Um, you know, public health labs, particularly from a global perspective, usually if it's not TB, it's gone. You know, we throw it away. We, we don't care what it is. That's not our charge. That has been changing because in the U.S., for example, uh, labs are starting to see more NTM than they do TB. So now their charge is changing. And what they're trying to do is figure out what this organism is. So now we do see some, some degree of speciation. Usually we don't see susceptibility testing in those labs. Those usually get sent to us or other reference labs, but, but they're doing the identification component. The other thing is that with molecular methods, things are changing so quickly that um, we're able to rapidly identify at least the most common specimens relatively cheaply. So I think you'll see, uh, particularly the bigger public health labs, will be doing more NTM work in the future. Um, but, okay. But otherwise, we have multiple reference labs, so it's very easy for them to, you know, send them out. Okay. Um, so somebody's asking about um, the equilibrium in the lung microbiota. Um, that might be disrupted by antibiotics. Is is there something, like, are there some disruptions that could favor more pathogenic species? Is there anything that you know about the lung microbiota that might be? 
Yeah. Well, it, it, the lung is interesting. The gut may actually end up being more interesting. So, um, because the gut microbiota has been, been associated with a disease outside the gut. And uh, so there's a lot of study occurring there. Uh, the, the lung microbiota um, is also very interesting. So there's no question if you take a CF patient and you look at their microbiota in a um, uh, exacerbation, you treat them, it looks different. But what we don't yet know is what's better. <laughs> and and so what, uh, that's what we need to understand better. Are there specific patterns that increase your risk of getting NTM, for example? Uh, or TB or pseudomonas? Um, I think the answer is probably yes, uh, but I, I don't think we're quite there yet to be able to, to do that. The other thing is that many of the studies that say they're measuring lung microbiota, they aren't. They're taking sputum specimens. Uh, so, you know, the, the true lung microbiota, you, you couldn't use a sputum. And this big debate in the area. The other thing is mycobacteria are hard to measure in the current approaches uh, studying microbiome because of that darn cell wall. Um, you know, they have to break the organism open to get the RNA out, and it's hard to get it out of the mycobacteria. So they're probably underrepresented in a lot of the, uh, the studies of uh, microbiome. I think it's a fascinating field. I think it will definitely change what we do in the future. Uh, I just don't think we know yet what's, what to do. Okay. Uh, going back to the um, ENT and, and the respiratory tracts, how should you go about treating upper respiratory infections so it doesn't keep causing exacerbations? Does your ID doctor handle it or do you go to the ENT physician? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to vary um, from uh, probably provider to provider. Um, some ENT docs, you know, they don't treat you. They tell you to go see your ID doc or your primary. They diagnose. Um, you know, I, I think sinus disease is really complicated. Um, uh, the management is also complicated as to when surgery should be done, uh, whether you should have inhaled steroids or not, washes with or without antimicrobials. Um, and I'm so I'm not a sinus expert, but but I, but my patients often have sinus disease. And I think when they flare, it, it often flare in their sinuses, and then it's followed by a flare in their lung. So that's why I feel like they're connected in this regard. So I, I very much tell them, you need an ENT doctor, do what they say. Uh, if you have a flare, uh, I, if they're not comfortable treating you, then I'll treat you. But but they, they need to be treated. And I know we want to avoid overuse of antibiotics, but if someone has a flaring bacterial infection, it needs to be treated. It's going to cause damage, and uh, we're trying to prevent that from happening. Um, somebody's asking about airway clearance methods. If they have mild or moderate symptoms, do you, are there airway clearance methods that you think are better for mild to moderate? Well, you know, the one you'll do. Uh, so um, for us, we start people on, a, you know, an oscillating PEP valve. We usually combine that with saline. That's our first uh, approach. We do that in people with mild to severe. And then as they have more severe disease, that's often not enough. So we would then uh, consider something uh, like adding a VEST uh, therapy or the Valera. Um, but we, we feel like we have the best evidence with the combination of aerobica and saline or, or experience, maybe maybe not randomized trials, but experience with that. Um, and then I think the next component is how often do you do it? So if you have mild disease, you probably don't need to do it twice a day. Maybe once a day is enough. But if you have severe disease, we'd want you to do it twice a day. So we probably start a similar approach, but I think the frequency might vary. Um, the, somebody's asking about um, amicase and inhaled therapy. Um, how long sh should you be staying on that? Is there like a particular length of time or does it really depend on, you know, how they clear, whether yeah. they clear? <laughs> so, you know, so the current guidelines recommend in treatment refractory disease, and we define that as you're still culture positive after at least six months of guideline-based therapy. So the three-drug regimen, 
uh, that you start inhaled uh, amikacin. And specifically, the FDA-approved version um, is ALICE, um, amikacin liposome inhalation suspension. Once we start it, we continue it to the end of treatment. I mean, it's an active drug. It's one of the most active drugs we have. It's getting right to the site of the infection. So why would we not use that? Of course, if someone develops uh, side effects, we'll shorten or we'll stop it. Even if, in some cases, we may not even stop it. We may go to like three days a week treatment. You may decrease the frequency again. Um, so we do have to individualize it. But once we start it, we, we plan to go to the end of treatment. Okay. Um... So somebody's asking about, they'd like their ID doctor to send a sputum sample to, N to National Jewish. Um, they don't think they can travel to Denver. Uh, this they, Their doctor can do that, right? They can yeah. set up an account with the lab. I, I think yeah. I had a doctor do that for me yeah. once. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, anyone can do that, but it has to come through an order from the doctor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To do that. Um, somebody's asking about location. Where can I find out if there are countries where Mac has, where I guess there's less Mac than in the U.S.? Uh, does that even exist? <laughs> um, we sell that information for a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, so just quickly. So th these are environmental organisms. They're everywhere. So let's say you live in Florida. It's got a lot of abscesses, got a lot of Mac, it's hot and humid. Maybe you live in Louisiana or Hawaii, other states that are hot and humid, uh, and you want to get out of there. So you say, I'm moving to Arizona. So move to Arizona. Well, Arizona has coxie, you know, which is valley fever. It has a different species of mycobacteria called simii, which usually doesn't harm people. But when it does, it is very difficult to treat. Or you can go, heck, I'm going somewhere cold. I am going to Canada. And then you get Mycobacterium zenopi, which we have very little in the U.S., but it's they have some in Canada, very difficult to treat. Or you go, to, I'm going to Amsterdam, and you go there and you pick up that Malmoense. So the point is they're environmental, and they vary by geographic region. They vary by temperatures, latitude. I mean, it's complex. The other thing you should know is climate change. Climate change is going to alter all of this. So we will be seeing abscesses in places where we normally haven't seen it, you know, that have typically frozen in the winter uh, because abscesses typically is in places where it's not freezing. Um, and so it's going to change. I tell people if I knew the best place, I promise I'd tell you. Um, but if, if we think about it today without climate change, um, high and dry. So higher elevation, drier uh, environment should have less NTM in it, but it has it in it. It just has less. Um, okay. How common is it for treatment to take well over a year for cavitary MAC? Oh, that's, that's the norm. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, cavitary MAC, the failure rate is higher. Recurrence rate is not higher. It's actually higher in nodular bronchiectatic disease, but failure rate is higher. Uh, it's why we recommend adding amikacin, uh, IV amikacin at the beginning. Uh, even though the guidelines don't specifically say this, the common practice is we start with IV amikacin and then we transition to ALICE. Um, because again, cavitary disease is hard. Uh, we also just, you know, look at the, the possibility of surgical resection in cavitary disease. Um, we know that the uh, culture conversion is much higher after uh, surgery, but of course it's, it's not for everyone. But in those who we think that it is a reasonable approach, we would consider that. So there are a couple questions about um, chances of conversion. One person can't take a thamutol, another person saying they can't take rifampin. How do those things affect the chances of conversion, culture conversion? Yeah, it's, it's not just conversion that we're worried about. It's acquisition of resistance. You know, the worst thing that can happen is that you develop macrolide resistance. So if you pair azithromycin with rifampin, there's a high risk that you're going to develop macrolide resistance. 
So, so we would never do that. So we would want to add one or two drugs to that regimen to protect the macrolide and to add some in vitro activity. Um, it's easier to do that with rifampin because rifampin is pretty wimpy. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of activity. Ethambutol is the best drug that we have to protect against macrolide resistance. So if you're taking azithromycin and ethambutol, we're less worried about getting resistance. But it also <clears throat> may not be as active. Two studies are ongoing that are looking at two versus three drugs. Uh, one uh, called the two MAC two versus three trial, again, led by Kevin Winthrop in Oregon. We're all part of it. It's a very big trial. Almost 500 people enrolled who are randomized to get two versus three drugs. And, and the two drug regimen is azithromycin and ethambutol because we said rifampin. If we're going to drop one, let's drop that. We will have results I mean, uh, soon. I mean, the trial will end probably around September of this year, and then we have to follow people for a while. The other are the uh, the ALICE trials that are occurring in treatment naive MAC because people get randomized to two versus three drugs. So we're going to have some active, uh, some uh, evidence on how good is two drugs. The only thing I'll say is in uh, the ARISE cohort, which is the, one of the two versus three drugs looking at the inhaled amicacin, the culture conversion at six and seven months was really good in those who received the inhaled amicacin. It was not very good in those who received two drugs. Um, so at least in that one study, it only went out to six months. There was a significant difference in culture conversion. Our, our practice has been to typically try to find another drug to build into the regimen. We have um, a couple of questions about practices in other um, in other areas. Um, so somebody's uh, local doctor will only do um, sputum samples every two months instead of every month. Dental uh, to their treatment plan. Well, you know the guidelines say one to two, so they're they're working within the guidelines. We say every okay. one to two months. Um, it, it's just they might get treated a month longer than they would need to, you know. So um, we're we're trying to shorten their duration as much as possible. So if we can be more precise about when you convert, then your treatment duration is shorter. Okay. Um, somebody else is saying they're they're being treated for MAVM in France. Um, they don't do susceptibility testing at that hospital. Is that common elsewhere? I guess it depends on the... It's very common for in the U.S. for uh, community hospitals, uh, uh, e even many uh, universities, they don't do susceptibility testing. They send them to places like us, um, and we do susceptibility. If you look, and you'll, you know, Dr. Kari will be talking more about the lab, but a lot of the isolates that come to us for testing are specifically asking for susceptibility. Okay. Um, what is the danger of hemoptysis with MAC lung disease? Would treatment help eliminate the hemoptysis episodes or reduce them, or is that more related to the bronchiectasis? Um, well, it is related to the bronchiectasis, but in many, if not most cases of hemoptysis, there's often an underlying infectious component. Um, uh, people who have mycobacterial disease, people who have pseudomonas, other infections, they can certainly develop a hemoptysis. We, and we, so we do treat in that setting. Um, if it's focal disease, we also look at whether or not we can do surgery because uh, that's curative usually for hemoptysis. If we can identify where the bleeding is coming from, that's a challenge, but we've tried to do that. Uh, so yeah, we, we would consider treatment in someone having hemoptysis uh, as, a, as, a pro, as opposed to watchful waiting. Um, oh, a question about ethambutol and side effects. How often should they see their ophthalmologist? How often do you recommend monitoring? Um, it's somewhat dose dependent. So um, we use different doses of ethambutol depending on whether we give things daily or intermittently and how long we give it. Um, so we would individualize it. But we do, I would say our average is we do a baseline uh, and then we do it every uh, two to three months. In between, we recommend people do it every day at home, meaning we ask you, read the same font every day. You will notice before you see your ophthalmologist whether or not there's a change, whether there's some blurring. 
uh, and, and we think that if you look at uh, historically when people have developed optic neuritis and lost vision or some vision uh, or red green color discrimination, it occurs in between the monitoring visits. And, and that's the bottom line. So we don't want people to wait to the next one. If you notice something, you stop that drug and you contact your 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 provider. Okay. Um, how often does successful treatment of MAC reduce, reduce the nodules um, in size or the number of no nodules that somebody has? Yes, um, it's quite variable what we see on CT scans. And just in the setting of bronchiectasis, we always see this kind of waxing and waning of nodules. Um, it's just part of something we learn to to see and, and figure out is this too much or too, or is this just your kind of the noise in that individual. Um, some nodules don't change. Uh, some become scars, and so they, their size may not change. Uh, they may become more dense as they get uh, more fibrous or they get calcification in them. Uh, on the other hand, you might see resolution of everything. All all of them, all the nodules can go away. It's uh, looking at that first CT, you can't predict what's going to happen, which nodules are going to go, which ones are going to stay the same. It's just not possible. Here's an interesting question. We're going to skip around a bit because we are coming up on 3.30, and I know, Chuck, you may have to go at some point. Um, but how important is colony count as a factor in whether you treat? Yeah, so the, the I'm, I'm looking at my calendar as I speak. Um, the the colony counts are just a measure of bacterial load. And so there are different ways to measure bacterial load. We can measure it by the smear that I mentioned before. If you're smear positive, you have a higher load. We can measure it by the number of positive cultures. If you have 10 positive cultures over six months versus only four of 10 are positive, you have a higher bacillary load. The semi-quantitative accounts that we do at National Jewish, where we give you the colony count, is giving us a more precise assessment of that load. It's one reason um, companies that are doing trials, they all want to add it in there to see if they can more precisely determine that someone's getting better. And, and then there's, uh, but there's, there's no randomized trial that has compared that approach to not doing that. So this is all experiential. Um, but we have for decades at National Jewish used that to help us make that watchful waiting treatment decision. And, and, and we find it very useful. Uh, I have someone who's growing 25 colonies every time. They bounce to five, then they're down to 10, and but they're really not over 400. And they're stable. But when I start to see that go 200, 300, 400, something is happening that is not good. Now, that could be they stopped doing their airway clearance. And that's the discussion I'm going to have. You might want to start that again. Uh, but it could be that or And if I have an image for a while, maybe that's a time to image because I'm looking to see, I'm because I'm suspecting there's progression. So a rising colony count might make us just look at things a little differently. Um, sometimes you'll see someone who's stable, 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 and then boom, there's a high colony count. Uh, and then they're stable again. What they just did, they just coughed up a plug. And that's why it bounced. Because in mucus plugs, there's high colony counts in those. So uh, we find it useful. I know other centers like the University of Texas Tyler, they also find it useful. But most labs don't do it. Uh, it takes time, which adds cost, and they don't want to do it. Um, Somebody is asking, they had a susceptibility test um, to look at error case. They, no they noted that there was a strain listed as Mycobacterium paraffinicum. Paraffinicum. Huh? Okay. Uh, we have. I haven't heard of that one. She hasn't heard of that one. <laughs> um, what is it? Yeah. So paraffinicum is a, a fairly unusual organism. It's a non-pathogen. Uh, when we see it, we totally ignore it. So again, it's in water. That's where you typically find it. Uh, but fortunately, you, you don't need to worry about it. The good news is when you see those, you're like, I've never heard of this. There's a good chance we haven't heard of it. Because out of those 200 species, you know, most of them don't grow in human specimens. They're environmental. Um, there, there are websites that, um, you know, list all the species. Uh, and it's the same ones we go to. Um, 
if we get something we've never heard of, we go look them up. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, are, here's an interesting one. Are there any known issues or interactions between MAC drugs and then and fungal nail infections? I guess, are there medication interactions? Is there a causal effect with your on antibiotics? If, if you're on antifungals? I, I don't know. Are there, they're saying, are there any known side effects between MAC drugs and fungal nail infections? I guess, would fungal okay. nail infections be something that might occur more if you're on antibiotics? Or Yeah, I, generally speaking, uh, we don't see uh, nail infections on the uh, MAC medications. Um, if they do get it, there is a drug interaction with the drugs that you use to treat the fungal infections and with FAMPIN. So if someone's going to start an antifungal, we want to know which one uh, so that we can look to make sure that we're uh, uh, dealing with that interaction that occurs with the FAMPIN. Um, okay. There's a couple of questions about surgery. Um, one person's asking if that can result in um, sort of additional uh, scarring or problems. And um, one person's um, asking about what it, if they had surgeries for severe cavitation, what are the chances of reinfection? Um, so when you have surgery, there will be some healing. That means scarring. Um, with today's robotic surgeries or video-assisted surgery, that's pretty minimal. Uh, different than in the past where we did the big, large incisions in the chest. Um, when you have surgery, we don't get everything, right? So there's usually some residual bronchiectasis, maybe on the other side or a different lobe. And, and then it gets into the severity of that, because if there's bronchiectasis, you have an increased risk of getting NTM, uh, and that's a lifelong. Um, so yes, if there's something left behind in terms of bronchiectasis, recurrence is still possible. But that's prob probably also dependent on how severe that disease is. And part of the whole thing of surgery is getting the severe part out, leaving the milder part behind. So your risk should go down, uh, shouldn't go up um, when, when you have uh, um, surgery. If you have cavitary disease that's been removed, again, it's all how much was left behind um, and how severe it is. Okay, I'm going to do two more questions. One, if we have bronchiectasis, should we wear masks when out? I'm going to go with yes, but I'd be interested in what you have to say. <laughs> well, when, when they go out, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't tell people specifically to wear masks when they go out. I think during COVID, I certainly did. Uh, and I think if you're going into a high-risk situation, which is a crowded place, particularly now, COVID is like all over the place right now. Uh, we had multiple staff out with uh, COVID, um, then I would definitely wear it on planes. And again, I consider that high risk. Uh, so in high risk situations, mainly means crowded. Uh, if you're around little kids, um, because there may not be COVID, it may be RSV, maybe something still very bad, then I would do that. I also tell people when you go out, uh, whether you wear a mask or not, but particularly if you don't, come home and do airway clearance. You know, if you inhaled something in your environment out having fun, uh, let's let's keep having fun. Let's do airway clearance. Let's get whatever it is out as much as you can before it gets established. Uh, this is particular for people I, who swim. Uh, I, and they have to swim because they have rheumatoid. It's the only way they can exercise. I say just plan when you get home to do a good airway clearance session. Okay, the, the last one, we have a couple of questions about um, using an airway clearance device like an aerobica. Um, can they use it alone or should do they have to use it with a nebulizing agent like saline? Yeah, I think, again, we're looking at severity of disease. Um, for very mild disease, the aerobica is probably fine. Um, I, I, th I think the most evidence for preventing exacerbations is with saline. So if you're looking at evidence for a benefit, saline rises to the top. Um, and the aerobica um, is, we like that one specifically because it's so easy to do inline saline with it. And now you get the added benefit of the vibration, the back pressure that you don't get with saline. So it, it's, it's just logical that the, they ought to work better together. 
Uh, but definitely we have people with very mild disease, mostly dry coughs. And yeah, they're just doing aerobica. And also if you're out and about somewhere, <laughs> you can just do it without the saline. Yeah. I suppose yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. When people travel, go on vacation, if they're doing well, we don't tell them to lug everything with them. But we go, that aerobica, you can just put in a purse or a bag, you know, so carry that with you and do that. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have any more time. I know there are some questions left, but um, thank you so much, Chuck. This was a wonderful presentation. I think everybody learned a great deal today. I know I did. Um, everybody, thank you for attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. The video for this presentation will be available in a few weeks. We will send out the link to that. And uh, don't forget to check out worldntmday.org for the uh, registration links for the upcoming presentations as well. Chuck, thank you All so right. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.